Hi, good morning. Hello. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's uh, so nice to see you all. Carrie Washington and I met. <laughs> this is so surreal. <laughs> this is so surreal. I was a senior in high school, mm -hmm. and Carrie was in eighth grade. She was a rising ninth grader. <laughs> Which meant a whole different uniform. <laughs> <laughs> a whole different uniform. And uh, we were in school together at a school called Spence in New York City, a girls' school. And I was in an a cappella singing group called Triple Trio. And Because there were nine of us. <laughs> <laughs> Although now there's a lot more people in Triple Trio. You're, really? I swear. Oh, I went back weird. to Spence and there was like 30 people in Triple Trio and I was like, you might need to change, change the, the name. name. Um, You're supposed to excel at math, ladies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so um, we were holding auditions because a bunch of us were graduating. And in walks Carrie Washington, the most beautiful. First of all, your face has not changed, like no aging whatsoever. This beautiful eighth grader comes in, so confident. Really? Yeah, in front huh. of all these seniors. The and acting began, because I was not feeling confident. <laughs> and uh, she opened her mouth, and the most exquisite voice came out of this eighth grader. And um, she, she got into Triple Trio. So I wanted to ask you, how come you never sing? Oh, um, I do, just not really publicly. Um, I sing in the shower, I sing to my kids. I do, I miss it a lot. In some ways, weirdly, I think singing is even more personal for me than acting. And I just haven't really had the right opportunity yet. Do you look for parts everywhere you get to sing? I'm open to it. I'm open to it. I yeah. hope you do. Thank you, it's good encouragement. Yeah, because also I heard that J-Lo was one of your dance teachers in the Bronx. Is this true? true? It's so true. I mean, that is, wait, can you just tell me a little bit about that? So I, um, I grew up in the same section of the Bronx as Jennifer, um, like the Castle Hill Soundview section, and we had a beloved teacher, Larry, who fell ill um, in the 80s, and... Um, and he had to leave often. And Jennifer was one of the bigger girls, was like slightly older, but she substituted for classes. So I got, like, I remember she stepped in for flamenco and she said, I only took flamenco so I could wear red high heels, but she, <laughs> she, um, and it's beautiful, but I took, she did flamenco and a couple ballet classes and jazz. And she definitely was like, it was, it's interesting that I, um, had both of you as kind of beacons for it being possible, you know, to like take this risk and try to find my way in this world that felt so, so foreign. So speaking of worlds that felt foreign, you grew up in the Bronx and then you came to Spence in seventh grade. Yeah. Um, in the late 80s. Yeah. Uh, and Spence at that time was predominantly a white school. Yes. It's changed a lot now. It I was has. back last year. It's uh -huh. much more diverse. It is. What was that experience like for you? And how did you get there? Um, I got there because, I mean, luckily, I have this extraordinary mom who is a retired professor of education. And so education was always first and foremost in my family. And um, she felt like I wasn't being challenged enough in the public schools that I was in. I remember the talented and gifted program in the Bronx actually got moved out of the school in my neighborhood to a predominantly white neighborhood in the North Bronx. Um, and so the second language that we took in that school was Italian rather than Spanish, because it was a mostly Italian American community. I remember at the sixth grade graduation with all these kids who were like speaking Italian with their grandmothers at home and I won the Italian language award and my mother was like, I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm done. <laughs> like, I need to put you in a different environment um, and so I started interviewing at all the you know Dalton and Chapin and Brearley and all the schools in Riverdale and Fieldston and to be honest Spence gave me the largest financial aid package and I think I also was really intrigued with the idea of a single-sex education like I remember I was kind of a 
I don't know about it. I don't know if I would say a tomboy, but I was super unconscious about what I looked like. And so I felt like I could not, I could get through school and not think about what I looked like at Spence in a different right. kind of way. So yeah, so that's how I got there. And it was an absolute culture shock. Like, compl- I mean, I, like we were rich in the Bronx because we had like two cars and a dishwasher and a microwave. And then I got to Spence and it was like helipads on people's roofs in the Hamptons. And I didn't, I didn't, um, I, I really didn't know how to comprehend it. Like I, in, in our apartment building in the Bronx, you know, the elevator door opens and there are like 15 apartments on the floor. And I specifically remember the feeling in my stomach when the first time I was on an elevator and the elevator doors opened and that was the apartment. And I remember it because it was this combination of awe, but also anger. Mm. Like there was a sense of betrayal that nobody I knew from where I was from lived that way. Um, And that I had no idea, like there was a way of living that was completely inaccessible, it was invisible to my community. And I remember in that moment thinking, I cannot present any of these feelings I'm having right now because it will identify me as other, right? Like these are my new friends at Spence and this is their norm. And so if I ask a bunch of questions or act like this is weird, I will identify myself as being outside their circle. And so I have to act like this is normal and figure out what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, what is going on? Because my parents were really hardworking people and they were good people and I didn't understand why. Like, how come nobody I know lives this way? And how come most of the people who live this way look a certain way that involves a lot less melanin? <laughs> were you able to go home and have that conversation with your parents? No, I wasn't. Because I also felt like a... I just, I just, my heart just broke a little bit for this little 11 year old girl who Mm -hmm. like, I I also didn't want to make my parents uncomfortable or have my parents feel like they were less than or that I felt like they weren't providing. Um, So I just really tried to metabolize it a lot on my own. And how did you do that? Um... I think in some ways that's, that was the beginning of me understanding, not necessarily like, you know, and suddenly a star was born. Like I didn't become an actor because of that, but I did start to understand like, oh, there's a level of identity that is about performance. There are, you know, I started to, to, to look at my life almost anthropologically, right? right? Like, oh, when I get on the subway in the morning, there's a particular way that people walk and talk and dress and and eat and breathe even. And 45 minutes later, there's a totally different way that people walk and talk and eat and breathe. And even, you know, learning like, oh, my mom used to tell me to get off the subway at 86th Street instead of 96th Street, but why? Like 96th Street was actually closer to the school in the way the walk was, but like it was safer to get off at 86. Like it just started understanding all these kind of cultural indicators and and what code switching looked like and felt like. And is that something that, you know, that sort of fish out of water feeling, did you end up, have you felt that a lot in your life? Like, has that been a component of something you felt you need to overcome in order to fully inhabit yourself? Did you feel that way at college or in your first acting job? Yeah, I do. It's fun. It was weird. I was thinking about this last night because I was trying to think, like, what will Gwyneth ask me? <laughs> Like a good Spence girl, I was over preparing. Um, and I was, I was actually, to be totally honest, I was thinking about the fact that I've told the J Lo story more often in terms of like there being somebody who was from where I was from who made it, yeah. who made me feel like I could make it. And I was thinking, to be completely transparent, like I didn't have that same reaction to you making it right. because 
it was like, oh, I assigned that to you being part of that world. It wasn't like a fish out of water. It wasn't like a kid from the Bronx making it in Hollywood. It was like somebody who was of that world, whose right. parents were already in that world. It does not to take anything away from the immense work ethic and how hard no, you work to create but what it you makes have. Sense. But it, it was, it, I think it's part of what made me not identify in the same ways. So I do think, I think imposter syndrome is something that I have worked really hard at and still do at times. Like I can hear the little voice, I'll be sitting in a particular meeting and thinking like, you know, you just hear that record that, that tells you that what you have to offer in the meeting isn't as valid and I've just really learned to know that that is a false mm. message, that that's right. not truth and to go like, thank you for sharing, please move to the side, I have more <laughs> important thoughts. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. One more question about Spence, and yes. then I'll, I'll We can talk about on. Spence the whole time. <laughs> well, you know, it, it was such a critical part that the education there, Ugh, the yeah. sisterhood there, yep. um, it was such a critical part in my development and, too. and making me who I am today. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered, you know, when you look back at By your, the way, Gwyneth was always cool. <laughs> I so remember. <laughs> no, not in seventh and eighth grade. Well, okay, you weren't maybe. there yet. By, by junior, senior year, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel so validated. <laughs> I'm serious. Um, but when you look back at that time, like how important do you think Spence particularly was in the trajectory of your life? It was hugely important. I mean, I, again, I have phenomenal parents who were, they really worked hard to help me be who I am today, but I know my whole worldview, my understanding of what was possible changed, but also the education that we got. I mean, mm. I remember getting, to, I don't know if you had this, I got to college and I was like, you guys are still doing your homework? <laughs> like, what is that? Because we had such incredible skills yeah. in terms of really how to think yes. about things, not just like memorizing, how to approach, how to be a thinking person, how to yes. problem solve, how to learn. Yeah. Um, and I think it also has really changed the kind of actor that I am. Because right. I do think as an actor, I work kind of anthropologically and I think a lot about psychology and history and I think I credit that to Spence entirely, almost entirely. Yeah, and that very Socratic method of, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we were so lucky to have just a few young women around a table yeah. talking something out. Yeah, and, and not being afraid to have a perspective. Or, or ask a question mm -hmm. or seem ignorant by asking a question. Right. I think That's it's right. informed how I am in my job now. I, I don't have shame around asking questions, and I yeah. think that's how you become a woman on top. You know, you, I agree. you, you embody that vulnerability or the ignorance that you have and, and, and don't let it turn into a shaming that's mechanism. Right. That's right. Yeah, you understand that in order to learn, you must be honest about not knowing. Mm. And I think that's, I think it's hugely valuable. Yeah. So how did you go from college? How did you start? becoming such a big star. What happened? <laughs> um, I'm still working on it. Um, I, when I was in college, like halfway through college, I did, I was terrified to be an actor. I didn't, I, I never thought that this was a career. And I, I really, I did not think of myself as the kind of person, for whatever reason, this speaks to your earlier question, who was on the cover of magazines. Like, I just wasn't that girl. I wasn't interested in it. I didn't want it. I wasn't about fashion or beauty. I just really, really liked telling stories and becoming other people. Yeah. And particularly early, you know, when I was in college and just after college, I think acting for me was a lot about, like, I wasn't very comfortable with myself, mm -hmm. and so I really preferred to be other people. Um, and as I've moved through my career and through becoming a more um, seasoned actor, um, I, I'm learning that it, it is really more about revealing myself as, oppo as opposed to hiding myself. But um, that's really interesting. Yeah. How are you doing that? And do you think that you need to sort of fully be yourself as a woman first before you can reveal yourself in that way? And that's why we wait? I feel like 
I feel like characters come into my life at a point when I need to learn something about that character's journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find that I'm really only able to do that character justice, to like really bring that character to life when I'm willing to have the courage to go into that lesson and to reveal those things about myself to myself and therefore to audiences. Okay. This is so fascinating. So this is a perfect time to ask you about American Sun. Yeah. So American Sun was a play you did on Broadway. Yes. And I'm going to ask you what it's about, but Netflix basically built the set. Is that right? And then shot the play yes. and it's airing in November? Yes, November 1st. We rebuilt the set on a soundstage in Brooklyn. Okay, so tell yeah. us what it's about, the play. Um, so American Sun is, it's basically 90 minutes in real time of the lobby of a police precinct. And it's a black mom and a white dad who are frantically, desperately looking for their 18-year-old son who has just had some kind of altercation with the cops, but we don't know what. Um, and so it really is like being dropped into this family's nightmare, the family of a mixed race black kid um, to try to figure out, is he okay? Um, yeah. And it's told from the perspective of four different yes, characters in the play. Four very different characters. And they are? They are um, myself, Kendra, who's the mom, and um, my husband, um, and then uh, two law enforcement officials. And does the biracial nature of the couple mm -hmm. play into the story? Hugely. Um, hugely. It does a lot of things. One is that um, the writer, Christopher Demos Brown, who's so lovely and smart, and, and I think it's such a special project, but by making this kid biracial, we take an issue about you know, police in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. And we make it not just a black people's problem, right? Because this kid, our son, Jamal, belongs to everybody. Um, and so if he's in trouble, we're all in trouble. Mm -hmm. It the plays about so many things because of these four characters. But I think a lot of what it's about is as the nightmare of what is happening with Jamal unfolds, what is also unfolding is this love story between this couple that is recently separated and they love each other desperately, but they are having a really hard time crossing these cultural divides of how do they raise this biracial kid? Should they be raising him as just any other kid? Do they need to raise him differently because he's black? Do they need to have different kinds of understanding and empathy for his experience? And I think in a lot of ways for me, I identified with Kendra, the lead character, but I also really identify with Jamal. I mean, she talks, Kendra talks about how Jamal is having a hard time being one of very few black kids at his school. And how um, she thinks he's depressed because he doesn't know where to fit in or how to identify. And I think in some ways, Kendra and Scott, the parents, are kind of stand-ins for our very binary culture right now. And for me, what's part of what's important is that we're not listening to each other enough, I think, right now. You know, we only follow the people on social media who express our views, and we watch the news channels that give us the messages that we can go to sleep at night after hearing. And it's we're, we're not... Um, we're having a hard time going into spaces where the conversations are more nuanced and complicated and we have to be willing to hear things that push us outside of our comfort zones. But these characters are forced to do that. And it, it's private conversations happening in a public space, so we feel like a fly on the wall and, and we are forced to listen. And even in reading it, I found myself experiencing empathy for characters I didn't expect to and finding commonalities in places that I thought no way will I understand that perspective. So, wow, it's fascinating. It's really uh, fun. Might be the wrong word, but it, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> Why? How do you think we can increase our capacity to listen to people with whom we don't innately agree with? 
Yeah, I've been talking about this a lot with Reese Witherspoon, actually, because oh, yeah. we're doing this project called Little Fires Everywhere. And, um, and it is also a lot about kind of the cultural divide and how we figure out how to coexist with people who threaten us because they're so different. Um, and she's been talking a lot about white fragility and this concept of like just being willing to sit in our own discomfort more. Right. Um, and we were even talking about it before, like, I, I think it's something that I'm really working on even as a parent, for me to sit in my own discomfort and to help my kids be able to sit in their own discomfort mm. because we are such an escapist society. That's we true. want a quick fix. We don't want to feel the feelings. We want to move over the feelings. We want to brush them away. We want to do whatever we can to not feel vulnerable. And, um, and helping them and myself to be willing to feel the feelings and sit in it and listen, I think is really important. Yeah. I'm always amazed too at how culturally we are not taught to do that. Yeah. We're not, we are taught that all of these very human feelings, anger, grief, sadness, jealousy, any of these feelings that we associate with negative qualities that it's, we're not supposed to feel them. Yeah. Um, and we don't have the capacity to sit with that feeling of like incredible discomfort. And you know, what I always try to tell my kids is just don't resist it because the more you resist it, the more it persists. That's like right. just feel it, let yeah. it go, you know? Um, and it's, it's, we don't, but we don't have the tools in the culture. Like we, we certainly weren't taught that. I mean, oh I was God, no. taught like, you know, behave, don't, yes. don't do that. Don't uh -huh. say that. Don't show a lot of emotion in public and, yeah. you know, by the, by the rules of society, we're not meant to do that. So how do you think about um, increasing that capacity or that permissibility in your house? Like with yeah. your kids, how do you create that? Yeah, I'm, I'm still figuring it out because I had a very similar upbringing. I mean, literally, m my mom sent me to the children's theater company in the Bronx because she, I tease her that she spent her whole life figuring out how to not have a feeling. <laughs> and then I was born and she was like, who is this walking id? Like, I just was, I was like, feelings everywhere. And she was like, I can, like, you need to go do that in another space, not in my house. Um, and thank God, right? Because I found the theater and there, like, we're such strange people. Like, we sit around waiting for somebody to give us a reason to cry. Um, like, we're, so, actors are such strange people. Um, like, please send me a script where I get to cry and be mad and then laugh. And like, it's such mental illness. But anyway, um, <laughs> So I, I think I try, I mean, I, one is I try to have real feelings in front of my kids. Like, and I, I, like, when my daughter was three, I remember sitting in the car with her and I said, I, this was the truth and I decided to share it with her on the drive to preschool. I said, you know, I was crying last night. <laughs> and she was like, why? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, somebody said something at work that really hurt my feelings. And, um, and, and so I went to daddy. I said, in the same way that like you go to mommy or um, to ama if you're having a hard time, like sometimes daddy holds me in the way that, that I hold you. And she was like, <laughs> I didn't want to hear any of it. <laughs> but I knew that it was right. Like I knew that she needs to know that, that it's okay. And, and that she's not the only person that gets to have feelings in the house, you know, like, um, it's, it's really funny now, my, the, you know, I'll hear them say, like, you hurt my feelings. Well, you hurt my feelings, like, they're to each other. Um, that we all, we all have feelings, and we get to sit in them together and talk it through and be there for each other, as opposed to, you know, how I was raised, which was like, I'm fine, everything's fine. All of the adults in my life were saying, everything's fine, and it wasn't. And the message I got was, don't have feelings, and if you're having them, lie about them, and do not be intimate with your feelings, you know? So how did you come to get intimate with your feelings and yourself? They're just so big, I couldn't <laughs> avoid them. <laughs> Um, I found therapy in college, um, and... Thank God. Yeah, honestly, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think I really needed it. <laughs> I know I did, but it's, it's been invaluable. I mean, for me, I've been 
in and out of therapy for the majority of my life. And I was in a conversation with somebody recently where they were like, well, don't you think that's a problem? Like, maybe you need a different therapist. And I was like, oh, no. Like, this isn't, I'm not in it to be done. Like, this is a gift I give myself. This is how I, like, I have, the way I have a trainer for my body, this is my mental trainer. Because in my life, I'm always... Um, taking new risks and, and I want to be learning and growing and so I want to give myself the mental and emotional support to stay in shape mentally and emotionally for myself, for my work, for my family. So I, I love it. I, I love it. I think it's really important. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I would be a basket case without my therapist. Right. Honestly, I think. <laughs> yeah. Me too. I do want to ask you about the project that you're doing with Reese yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, we love Reese Witherspoon. What's not to love? She's pretty She's fucking awesome. She's the best, yeah. She's a powerhouse. She is. She's maybe the shortest, most powerful person I I've know. ever met in my life. <laughs> it's so I, true. Uh, it's so incredible. It's like... She's she, like Hermia, right? It's like un, unreal. I know. She's amazing. So yeah. how did you guys come together to produce and star in Little Fires Everywhere? Totally her idea, of course. <laughs> um, she read this phenomenal novel um, by Celeste Ng, and, um, and she actually emailed me and said, I found something for us. And I was like, okay. And then a little part of me was like, I wonder what she thinks is right for me. Um, and, uh, and I started reading it and I always tease her that it, like she made me a terrible mom for a week because I was like hiding in my bathroom. Like I had to finish the book. <laughs> they were like cu crying kids. And I was like, I figure it out. Um, <laughs> And uh, I just loved it. I loved it. And I loved the idea. You know, in the novel, my character is not explicitly African-American. She is other in some way. And Celeste has said that in her mind, she's always thought of her as a person of color. But as an Asian woman, she didn't necessarily feel like she... Anyway, um, she'll talk about that in some other interview. But, um, but, but obviously, we made her black because I'm black. And um, this is the news flash. And... Um, <laughs> And it's just such an exciting approach to that character and that world. And, and she and I get to play polar opposites as women, which is also really fun because we're actually very similar. My dad was on set the other day and he was like, you guys are like photo negatives of each other. You're like the black and white version of each other um, or like the north south version of each other. Um, but I, I love that we're kind of taking those slight differences and extending them into these very, very different archetypes of womanhood and motherhood in the 90s. It's so fun. Oh, it takes place in the mm -hmm. 90s. Yeah. And how does does race play a part at all in the novel? It does. It. In the novel, race does play a part, but it plays, there are, um, there are lots of moms in the novel, and we each have, a, our characters each have a friend. Hers is another white woman in Shaker Heights. It takes place in Shaker Heights, Ohio. And mine is a Chinese woman, um, an immigrant. And so that, the politics of her Chinese identity and... Um, lack of citizenship and, um, and our shared um, low-income status. Those things are dealt with a lot explicitly in the book. Right. And, but it's predominantly, if you had to kind of recapitulate what it's about, it's about mothers and daughters? Yeah. It's very much about um, what it means to be a mom, what it means to be a good mom, how What we, does it mean to be I a good mom? Mean, that's what it's about. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a lot about how many different kind, how many different ways you can be a good mom, and how how much we judge each other on our different approaches to parenting. Um, and it's also about the challenge of being a mom and having a child who doesn't necessarily identify with you or live in the world according to your plan, mm -hmm. which is. I think the definition of parenting, right? Like there's yeah. this very brief period, if this is how you enter motherhood, where they're inside you and you get to control what they eat and what they hear. And, and once they're out, it's just an, a walk toward individuation at all yeah. times. How are you, or what would your definition of, like how are you a good mother? Well, <laughs> 
Um, I'll probably be talking about that a lot in therapy this week. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I do think that doing the show is triggering a lot of introspection for me around, am I a good mom and how am I a good mom and what kind of mothering did I receive and what, what parts of that do I want to mirror and what parts of that do I want to do differently? Um, but how am I, I'm sort of, I'm sort of avoiding your question. Um, how am I a good mother? I try to be really present for my kids. I try to be really present and I try to have them feel seen. Like I try to really, I'm not always with them, obviously, because I have a job, um, a career, but I, I try, when I'm with them, I want them to know that I am with them and that, um, that, I, that they matter to me. They for who they are, not for who I need them to be. Are there things that you know you have seen or experienced in your own childhood that you consciously try not to do? Like, are there sort of? <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Wait, I want to let you finish your question. <laughs> no, I I think the reason that I'm I'm so fascinated by this topic and um, and I think that you know as mothers so much of what we start to do is unconscious and sort of, yes. you know, so I'm always fascinated at the ways that people become conscious in their parenting. Yeah. Um, and like, what are the mechanisms by which they become more conscious? Like, okay, I'm actively going to not do yes. that. So are there, are there kind of overarching themes from your childhood or not even, it doesn't have to be, I don't, I don't want your mother to come like hunt me down <laughs> after this, but, or, or that you, you saw, for example, in that, you know, one floor apartment of yeah. a Spence classmate or, mm. you know, in other families, like, are there things that you saw that you thought, you know, that, that's what I want to arc away from. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I mean, the first thing that I thought about was, and I will answer your question, but I did, one thing that I do emulate in my mom's parenting, and I think this comes from her background in education, we laugh a lot in my family that if you dared to mention an interest, like... I have a cousin who was like, I love birds of prey. Or I think he said, I love hawks. But within a week, we were all at the Museum of Natural History like learning about birds of prey. <laughs> and I had another cousin who was interested in sharks. And so we all read Peter Benchley's Jaws that summer. And like, she really, this idea of immersive learning was That's my amazing. childhood. That's yes. Um, and so I do, I didn't realize that I was doing it but, until my husband was like, do you know how much our three-year-old has been to the museum? Like, <laughs> it's just, I do, I'm very interested in um, supporting their curiosities mm -hmm. and building on them. But um, I guess the big thing for me is, is truth. Um, it's just, I try to yes. be honest. Yes. I just really try to, to be honest with myself first and then with them and and within the zone of what's appropriate in parenting obviously I'm not like I had sex with your dad this morning um <laughs> I, we, we have to talk about vaginas it's good um but but I do it's really important to me that um that they feel like they are getting the truth from me um and that I'm able to hear their truth um, and that, that wasn't always the case in my childhood and in a lot of the people I love in their childhoods. I think generationally that yeah. was probably the case, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Are you going to have more children? <laughs> Are you? No. <laughs> I'm 109 years old. <laughs> You are not. You look amazing. For 109, you look amazing. Thank you. Um, I've had great work done. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, uh, I think I, in my mind, I kind of always, I don't know. I, th I thought like, oh, two or three. And my husband came with one and I've birthed two. So I have my three. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I just got two extras too. It's so, bonus babies it's are great. the ish. I don't want to <laughs> say the other thing because I don't want her to hear this and be like, you used a curse word to describe me. But I just love bonus babies. She's yeah. the best. How, what's your approach to stepmotherhood? 
yeah, I, um, I just love her. I got really lucky. Like oh. she, which I credit her mother. Like, I mean, my husband had something to do with it too. Um, <laughs> they are great parents. They're great parents. And I feel really lucky that I got to step into this co-parenting circle with yeah. them. That, and, um, and that's the other thing. I feel like there's three adults and three children, and we should not be outnumbered. Right. <laughs> um, that's probably pretty right? wise. It feels like otherwise it's mutiny. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 she's fantastic. My approach is really similar to what I said before. Like I want her to know that I see her, that I hear her, that she right. matters to me. I'm. I try to be really respectful um, and deferential to her mom, mm -hmm. um, but also to like be. Like to let her know that I am an adult in her life and I am on the co-parenting team and that's a role that I take seriously. Mm -hmm. And I may not have the years that the other, my other teammates have, but I still want to excel um, in this role. It's really important to me. Yeah. How old was she when you? When I met her, she was three or four. Um, she's 13 now. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. great. She's so great. They're That's so nice. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, trying to figure out or, you know, kind of redefine a family dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, you know, my husband and I, we both came with two. Congrats on your wedding. Oh, thanks. I really like being married. It's I really do too. Fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm very into it. Yay. But um, I, it's a different situation because we both came with two and yeah. we haven't had any of our own yeah. nor, and we won't. Mm -hmm. But I always find it so interesting to kind of be present to this ever-changing family dynamic and it's it's really it's it's been such a surprise how complex and rewarding yeah it it is and I think it's something that I don't know we don't we don't read enough about step parenting like I feel like somebody needs to write this book you know it's like true because we all I mean I I it's hard to find people who are not participating in a blended family dynamic it's true whether it's our own parents or our yeah. kids like we are all how we define family is so different now yes. and um being able to be open-hearted enough to embrace that those ever-evolving Dynamics. I just yeah. think it's so important. I and do too. And and uh, and it and it is complicated. Yeah. You know, it, it is. It's really. Yeah. That's so beautiful that you guys have been able to to do that. That's really nice. She's a great kid. I'm Aww. really lucky. Yeah. That's so nice. So this is sort of a weird question, mm -hmm. but so I very naively thought during the Obama administration, like, oh, we're mm -hmm. kind of getting to like a. I can see like a post-racial. America, like I feel it. Yeah. And I think I was a little early on that <laughs> feeling. Um, yeah. So I just wonder, like, what, what do you feel is going on right now? In we don't have to get political and talk about, you know, all, in, like from that standpoint, but, you know, did you feel that? Also, oh gosh, we're really on the cusp of something like this new amazing territory. And, and were you surprised by what has happened? Or am I just a naive white person that felt <laughs> like, oh, I really feel like we're, we've gotten somewhere. And do you know what I'm trying to I say? I do, I do. I, um, I think the difference probably is that I, I think what, what we share probably about the current state of race relations globally right now, but in particular in this country, is the heartbreak. Like I think I, I wouldn't say I was surprised, but I would say I was heartbroken. Um, so it, it's almost like, um, it's weirdly, this is a very weird analogy that I've, I, I've never, thought through before, so I might be very wrong, but um, I think there's something similar in like being in love with an addict, right? Of like, I knew who the country, I, I know who the country is, I know that our country was founded on, you know, I, I know that when the constitution was written, people who looked like me were three-fifths of a human being. Like, I know those things, they don't go away quickly. I know that there are pockets in the country that feel a certain way. I know that as a black woman, 
I don't easily think about driving cross country with my family, like that there are, that the dynamics are different in different places. Um, but I was hoping that there was a different level of recovery. You know, I was hoping that we were on this arc of justice and that we would keep, not that we could be post-racial, because I don't want us to be in a colorblind society. You know, Melody Hobson talks a lot about being race courageous as opposed to race blind, race bold. Um, I want us to be able to see our differences and have those differences not set the trajectories of our lives or right. our, of our kids' lives. But, um, but I wasn't expecting a relapse mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you, how do you feel that your role as a prominent, strong, incredible, famous black woman in society has changed at all or has it not? Or do you feel that you have a different degree of responsibility at this point in time? Yeah, you know, I feel like I've always had it. I mean, I, you know, there was a lot said in Scandal's first season about it being the first time a black woman was the lead of a network drama in 40 years. And at that point, I was like, I, in my mid-30s. So it hadn't been in my lifetime that I had seen a black woman as the lead of a network drama. God, I didn't even notice. I was just so, like, turned on by you and Tony <laughs> Goldwyn. <laughs> ah! That was the sexiest thing I've ever, the first show of that, the first season of that show. It was insane. I, I was like past the <laughs> goop vibrator, whatever. <laughs> wow. Tony's gonna be so happy when he hears that. <laughs> um, yeah, so. <laughs> The weird thing about being a woman of color who does what I do for a living is that it was really clear for, for me early on that to put myself, to treat my characters as if they were fully realized three-dimensional human beings, that that was not just an act of art, that that was a political act. You know, like when I did right. Save the Last Dance, I was playing somebody who society thinks of as a statistic. She's an inner city, teen mom, black kid. And that person, we discount. We don't pay attention to them. We cut their resources. We don't have high hopes. And That's I right. knew it was my job as an actor to, to make you leave that film feeling like you know Chenille, you love Chenille, you understand Chenille, you want to be Chenille. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I've now allowed millions and millions of people who will never meet Chenille to feel like they are one step closer to cultural understanding and acceptance and tolerance and empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think... You know, I, I did that in, with supporting roles and now I do it with lead roles. And you know, to be a woman and say like, I'm the center of the story as a woman, that's a political act. Yeah. To be a woman of color and say it is even more so. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's been amazing to watch how you've embodied it. Thank you. It's amazing. Do you, I wanna know just like mo working mom to working mom, like what are the things you do in your life to take care of yourself. We know therapy and, and trainer, but like, do you have any, like, do you meditate? Tell us about your kind of routines. I try, I come in and out of meditating. Um, Me too. I, Guys, I really want to be a good meditator. I do too, I do too, but I also, I don't want it to be a source of shame. I know. But I want to, I do. I always think about that quote, um, you know, there's that quote that Dalai Lama apparently was like looking at his schedule and somebody was like, oh, there's so much going on today. And he said, yeah, that means I should meditate twice as long. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, I want to be that person. I'm like, meditation's got to go. <laughs> um, so I, I journal a lot. Oh, right. I'm, I'm a writer. Like I like to write lists and journal. I'm, I get it out that way. Are you a Virgo? No, okay. I'm an Aquarius. Oh, um, but I do like to journal. It's like brain drain, and um, I mean, I I'm not great at it. <laughs> I'd like to to figure it out more. But the place I'm in right now is I feel a little bit like if I pick up another tool for self care, 
it means I'm not going to sleep enough, right? Like there's right. something that, so, um, you're busy. Trying. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a lot to, to juggle yeah. all at once. Are there any like hacks that you have? Like, do you take a bath every day or do you? When I was doing American Sun, I had to become like the goddess of self care. Right. Cause that play now, God, I wish I'd seen television it. event. Um, is um but now you can see it i know but i want to see both like i want to also go see it in theater (laughs) very sweet um but i really had to i mean that the level of intensity to like really drop into this nightmare and from the beginning to the end of the play kendra is just terrified she's just terrified um and and it was also really fun for me because coming out of Scandal, it was my first project after Scandal ended, and she is like the un-Olivia Pope. Like, Olivia Pope was always the most powerful person in every room, and Kendra spends the entire play trying to have some level of agency and right. and power, and um, and there's no Prada in her wardrobe. She just doesn't have any Prada. <laughs> um, but I, 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 so when, to do that play, like I could feel my adrenals were drained, like I was dehydrated, like I really had to up the ante on everything. And so I, what did you do? I, I was doing, um, I mean, taking lots of supplements and um, really trying to sleep enough. Although I remember, like I did Broadway almost 10 years ago, and when I did it the first time, I was like, you know, I would sleep till 11 and I don't talk until one. You know, it was like all this like very precious. And now of course at 7 a.m. my kids were like, wake up. <laughs> um, but I still tried to like take a lot of supplements, drink a ton of water. Um, I was doing rolfing and massage work and acupuncture and, um, and like really eating very clean. Mm-hmm. That's probably my biggest hack is trying to eat things that are good for me like try to put good fuel in the tank yeah yeah do you have um... i have your cookbooks oh. was that your question no <laughs> <laughs> but i do you should sign them for me i'll bring them next I time i'd love to <laughs> <laughs> um who are your female idols like who yeah or mentors oh please <laughs> I already know I'm way back to J-Lo in this whole thing. You already told me. <laughs> but who um, are your... I always who, thought of myself as like a combo of Gwyneth and J-Lo. Yeah. Um, I have a little I, bit I of speak, a Gwyneth, a little bit of J-Lo. <laughs> I speak for J-Lo when I say we are very flattered, both of us. Um, <laughs> That's when I'm trying to make myself feel good. <laughs> so who are the women both like kind of the IRL women and maybe yeah. the women that you haven't met that mm-hmm. really have helped, you know, guide you or yeah. mentored you? Um, my mom, Anita Hill. Yes. Oh, we have um, confirmation. Shonda Rhimes. Yes. Um, I actually, I have phenomenal, I don't want to get emotional, but I have amazing women on my team. Some of them are here. Um, and they are really inspiring. Like to have a badass female black woman manager and a badass white woman lawyer. Um, like that's, the, that's really important in my Amazing. world. Because it also just means, you know, like I, I can be in a negotiation and not have to explain to somebody why I can't do that as a black woman. Like there's already somebody in the room who has my back and understands. Um, or why as a mother I need this other thing now with my trailer. And again, there's somebody on the call who already gets it. Um, so that's been really important. Um, yeah, that's a bunch. Oprah, everybody's, everybody's, everybody's dream mentor person. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Melody Hobson, who I just want to bring Love. up. She's in, an Love. incredible woman. Love. Um, she's, well, do you want to sort of talk about her background? She's an incredible She's a finance, finance genius. Whiz world fixer, connector, Always in couture, head to toe. Always in couture, sparkly couture. Best dresser. Amazing wife and mom. Amazing you, hair always. Amazing. How yeah. did you get to know her? Um, we were on the board. Oh, this leads me to some others. Jane Fonda, Eva Ensler. We were on the board of V-Day together, which was the organization that grew out of Eva Ensler's Vagina Monologues. Vagina um, Monologues. We got it in again. I would say it was a drinking game. <laughs> Vagina, drink. Yes. <laughs> Next time. 
Um, so yeah, so we met on that board, and that board was just an amazing, I mean, Pat Mitchell was on that board. Really, I really got in a good circle of broads with that one. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see the politician. Oh. I'm really excited. How do you feel about it? Um, it's really good. I yeah. mean, I've seen, I've just seen the first episode, okay. so I think it's good. <laughs> um, Great. And uh, it's weird to be kind of st straddling two jobs at, at one time. And but you've always, right? Sort of. I mean, for the past, you know, 11 years, I've it's really been, been goop, goop for the, the occasional most part. marvel. It's it's a little bit weird, but I, I actually had a really nice time doing it. And okay. um, and Netflix is such a nice place to work. It really is. It's really great. They're, yeah, they're, they're they're pretty cool. I'm hoping that they will do more of this theater to yes, the, exactly. The this is such a new format for them, it right? It is, and it's really. I think it's so exciting because theater is such a special medium. Yes, it's so ritualistic, and yeah. to be in the room in the dark. It's like how we originally told stories yes. at campfires, but now you know the stories that are happening on Broadway are so important and they're only available to a tiny portion Segment, of the population. Yeah, so when we started American Sun, there were people on my social media in like Brazil and South Africa and London and Paris saying like, we have these issues in our community, I wish I could see it. And now they can because of Netflix. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>